so what you need to be able to know about this particular topic is uh, uh, who is an auditor, who is an auditor, who is an auditor, who is an auditor, then um, appoint, appointment of an auditor in a company, appointment of an auditor in a company, then you need to actually to be able to understand the duties duties of an auditor, duties of an auditor in a company, duties of an auditor in a company, then you need to actually to be able to understand um, auditors right to information, auditors right to information, auditors right to information, the other thing you need actually to be able to understand about auditors is the rights of an auditor, rights of an auditor, rights of an auditor. Of course, this one is one of them, it's actually very key, but uh, we have other general rights that the auditor should actually be able to enjoy while he's actually carrying out the audit, audit work. Then another thing you need to actually be able to understand here is the procedure procedure for the removal for the removal of an auditor procedure for the removal of an auditor so these are the key things that you should actually be able to understand in this particular topic who is an auditor of the company so appointment of an auditor how does it actually happen in the company so we can talk about appointment and remuneration of an auditor appointment and remuneration we can talk about appointment and remuneration of an auditor the duties why do they actually appoint an auditor in a company what will be his duties in in a company so the auditor's right to information is actually uh, very key then other rights of an auditor in a company so because we are saying the major right is actually to access the information in the company but of course he has other rights in the company for example you must actually pay an auditor once you appoint him as an auditor of the company so that is a right we'll see other rights that he is actually able to uh, to enjoy what is the procedure of actually being able to remove an auditor so you appointed him but now you want to remove him from from office uh, for example if his term has not actually come to uh, to an end so how will you basically be able to remove an auditor of the company how will you actually be able to remove uh, the auditor of, of the company so when you talk about an auditor so an auditor is actually an independent officer who is actually appointed most importantly to protect the interests he is actually mostly importantly appointed to protect the interests of investors so you can actually say investors or subscribers to the shares of of the company so he's actually an independent officer appointed to basically protect the interest of the shareholders or basically investors in, in a company. By being able to basically check on the affairs of the company and be able to ascertain whether they reflect a true and fair view about the company. Because uh, one thing you realize is that um, in a company, directors are normally appointed to basically, directors are normally appointed to basically and manage the company on behalf of uh, the shareholders of, of the company or members of the company or subscribers or investors of, of the company. So these particular investors are not actually always in the company there to monitor what is actually happening. So the key guys, they're actually usually the directors. So they can't just really trust the directors. So there has, there has to be an independent officer who basically has to ascertain whether this particular company its affairs actually reflect what is known as a true and fair view about, about the company. Because maybe these particular directors you've actually appointed, so those persons who have the mandate to ensure that proper books of accounts of the company are actually kept are usually the directors of, of the company. So sometimes, uh, so therefore these particular members who actually appointed them, they have to basically have an independent person. So there has to be an independent person who should actually be appointed to be able to try and actually check this particular books prepared by the directors of the company, do they actually reflect a true and fair view about the company? 
So it's usually appointed basically majorly to protect the interests of the subscribers or the investors of, of the company, the investors in the, in the company. So in simple terms, you can actually just basically say an auditor is actually an independent officer appointed to basically protect the interests of investors or subscribers of the company by being able to check whether uh, the books or the affairs of the company actually reflect a true and fair view about the company. Those books that have actually been prepared in the company, they actually reflect uh, what is actually happening on the ground or maybe on the ground, a bit too different or things actually may be different on the, on the ground. So it's usually actually an independent officer appointed to basically protect, that's the first thing you should actually be able to know, to protect the interest of investors in the, in the company by being able to check whether these books prepared maybe by the directors of the company reflect a true and fair view about, about the company, reflect a, a true and fair view about the company. So that is what we mean by an auditor in a company. That is what we mean by an auditor in, in a company. That is what we mean by an auditor in, in a company. That is what we mean by an auditor in, in a company. So uh, with regard to basically auditing uh, companies, auditing companies, so it basically means that uh, a company has to ensure uh, that it has actually appointed maybe an auditor to be able to check, uh, to check on its books or whether its books actually reflect a true and fair view about, about the company. So under the act, under the act uh, an auditor we are saying is actually uh, appointed to safeguard the interest of investors or subscribers in the, in the company. So uh, with regard to auditing the books of accounts of a company, books of accounts of a company, <clears throat> books of accounts of a company, it is that uh, all public companies, all public, all public companies must ensure, must ensure their books, their books of accounts, their books of accounts, are audited, are audited, are audited. Then this one actually also applies to companies. So this applies also. So this applies, this applies uh, also to companies, also to companies. This applies also to companies dealing in, dealing in banking, dealing in banking, dealing in banking or insurance business or insurance business or insurance business so every each and every public company must actually ensure that its books of accounts are actually uh, audited so this applies also to companies that are actually dealing in banking or maybe insurance business so it doesn't actually actually matter it doesn't actually matter <clears throat> for the case of private companies if it is a small private company or is actually it's a small company or is a small private company, then in such a case, it will actually be exempted from its books being mandatory uh, or its books actually being um, audited. It's not actually a must for small companies, which are, are private companies for their books of accounts to be audited. So the threshold, the threshold for basically uh, ascertaining that whether a company is actually a small company, uh, then a small company, so when you talk about a small company, we mean a small company basically means that the turnover, the turnover is not, uh, the turnover in a year, in a year is not more than 50 million. It's not more than 50 million or the net assets, net assets are not more than are not more than are not more than 20 million is that a case such a company will be categorized as actually being a small company so it is a small private company so if it, its turnover is not actually more than 50 million shillings in a year basically turnover means uh, uh, maybe your sales your sales do not actually exceed 50 million or maybe your net assets your net assets are not actually more than 20 million then in such a case, you will actually be categorized. <clears throat> you'll be categorized as actually being uh, a small company. So for small companies, which are actually private companies, is not a must for their books of accounts to be audited. It's not a must for their books of accounts to be uh, to be audited. 
But of course, uh, sometimes it just forces them to basically ensure that their books have actually been audited because, for example, if these particular small companies want, want, want to make a return, for example, to the Kenya Revenue Authority, then of course they must actually provide audited books. So sometimes even if you want to, nowadays, even if you want to open a bank account as a company or a limited company, a private company, you will be required to, pro, to bring audited financial statements for the last maybe three, three years. So other requirements actually just force these particular small companies to ensure that their books of accounts have actually been audited. But according to the Companies Act, if you look at the Companies Act, uh, private companies, which are actually small companies, is not a must under the Companies Act or under the statute. Uh, for them to ensure that their books are actually being audited each and every year. So if you, uh, this particular company is categorized as a small company, then in such a case, it basically means that under the Companies Act, it's not a must for these particular companies to ensure that their books of accounts have actually been audited. But of course, what I've just said then basically makes this one to become irrelevant because I'm saying for small companies, even if nowadays you need a bank account, they require you to basically bring what is known as a, uh, your audited financial statements for the last five, five years, or maybe three years. It's normally three years. For example, nowadays, if you want to make a return to the Kenya Revenue Authority, you have basically to provide your audited financial statements. So this one basically almost becomes irrelevant. But of course, that is what the Companies Act, Act actually states. If a company is a small company, it won't actually be, it's not mandatory for it to basically ensure that its books of accounts have actually been audited, have actually been audited. So uh, it means that uh, for a small company, I've told you how they categorize it under the Companies Act is, for example, if this particular company, the turnover or annual turnover is not actually more than 50, 50 million. But of course, this particular small company only applies to private companies. Because I've told you any public company, it doesn't matter the turnover or maybe the net assets, it must ensure that its books of accounts have actually been audited, whether it is small or big, the small company categorization does not actually apply to public companies. It only applies uh, to private companies. It only applies to private uh, companies. Then another reason that could actually make a company not to ensure that its books have actually been audited, for example, if is, for example, that particular company has been dormant for a whole financial year. So there's no transaction that has actually happened in that particular company. So that could actually make a company be exempted from actually ensuring that its books of accounts have actually been audited. Because what are you actually auditing? Because there's no any transaction that has actually happened in the, in the company. So in such a case, if the company has been dormant, has been dormant since maybe formation, or maybe in a particular financial year, or from the previous financial year, then in such a case, it means that there's no need for actually ensuring that the books of accounts have actually been audited. So sometimes it basically means that for a dormant company, or maybe if it has been dormant since formation, it's not a must for the books of accounts to be to be audited. For example, if it is actually a small company under private companies, then it's not a must for the books of accounts to be audited. And this is actually according to the Companies Act. But for public companies and any company that is dealing in basically insurance or banking, banking or insurance business, whether it is private or maybe public, it doesn't matter. It must actually ensure that its books of accounts are actually being, being audited. So maybe you could be asking, why is it actually a must for maybe banking or insurance business to ensure that their books of accounts are actually being audited? Mostly you find that, for example, banks, they basically uh, uh, have basically uh, money for their customers. You deposit your money there. So that particular money should actually be protected because there are several people who have an interest in, the, in banks and actually also insurance. Insurance businesses basically will give them your premiums. So you might not actually, maybe those premiums are not actually existing. If they don't provide audited books, how will you actually be able to ascertain this company still actually has our premiums, which are maybe actually safe. So in, basically it means that for banking and insurance business, they must ensure that their books of accounts have actually been, been audited. So that is with regard generally to a company actually auditing its books of its books of accounts, its books of accounts, and the books of accounts will actually be audited by the company being able to appoint a person known as an, an auditor. An auditor, I've said, is an independent officer appointed, uh, basically to protect the interests of the subscribers or investors in the company or shareholders or members of the company by being able to check whether the books of accounts or the affairs of the company actually reflect a true and fair, 
Fairview. Because in this case, we are seeing the books of accounts of a company. Those persons who have the mandate to prepare them are actually the directors of, of the company. So these directors could actually maybe collude and maybe cook the books of, of the company. So to protect their interest, they must appoint an independent. There's that particular word, independent. It must be there. When you talk about independent, is actually one of the requirements when actually appointing an auditor. He should actually be an independent officer. He doesn't have any relationship to do with, with the company. So in this case, it means that, for example, if this particular auditor being appointed is a relative to one of the directors, so then, then it means that there is no actually independence. So independence must actually be ascertained before this particular auditor is actually appointed. He's just an independent officer who doesn't have any relationship to do with, with the company. So coming in to be able to check whether the affairs of the company reflect a true and fair and fair view. So that is what we mean by, by an auditor. That is what we mean by, by an auditor. So we can actually be able to look at how he is actually appointed. So appointment of auditors, appointment of auditors. Actually here, we basically just summarize most of the things about an auditor. But if you want to know more about auditing, I think though the combiners who are doing auditing, you learn more about auditors and how they carry out their, their work. But here we just look at a summary of his key role in, in the company because he's actually a very important person in in a company. But if you want to learn more about auditors, then that one is actually basically explained in details under the, the subject known as auditing in section uh, section four. The process is actually undergoes in actually being able to ensure that he has actually ascertained whether he's actually independent or not. So there are all those professional requirements that he must actually be able to meet, for example, integrity. So if he fails to meet all those particular requirements, then of course, maybe he won't actually be able to serve as an auditor of, of the company, as an auditor of, of the company. So we can look at uh, how he's actually appointed. So qualifications uh, and appointment of an auditor. Qualifications and appointment of an auditor. So qualifications. Qualifications and appointment. of an auditor, of an auditor. Qualifications and appointment of an auditor. Qualifications and appointment of, of an auditor. So the key qualifications for one to be appointed as an auditor, so we have just two uh, key qualifications. Uh, we, we have just two key qualifications. Is that number one, number one is the qualifications, so these are the qualifications. So these are the qualifications. Qualifications, number one is he is a member. He is a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. He's a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of, of Kenya, that is ISPAC. Is a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. Or number two, he is a member of any other, any other relevant body, any other relevant body, any other relevant body under the Accountants Act, under the Accountants under the Accountants Act. Any other relevant body under the Accountants Act. Any other relevant body under the Accountants Act. So it is uh, mandatory for any person being appointed as an auditor of a company that is actually a member of this particular body known as the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of, of Kenya. So how do you become a member of this particular body? You must have actually done, so the route of actually being able to be a member of this particular body you must have actually basically done the CP exam up to final level, up to final level. Then of course you can actually be admitted as a member. If you practice for a certain period of time, then you'll be certified to basically to be, uh, to basically provide auditing services to any, to any person. So he's actually a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of, of Kenya. So he has done what you're actually just pursuing like CPA 
up to final level. So once you finish, you basically be registered as a member of ISPAC. If you basically have certain experience, then you can actually set up your own firm that basically can actually basically be approved to provide auditing services. So if you are the managing partner and you have the relevant experience, basically that particular auditing firm of yours, you as the managing partner, will basically be approved to be able to provide auditing uh, services. Or in this case, for example, you're just an individual, then of course for you to be appointed as an auditor in the in a, a auditor of a company, then you must be a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of, of Kenya. So in this case, there are two ways of actually being a member. You can actually be a corporate body being a member of ISPAC, or you can actually just be an individual being a member of, of ISPAC. So for example, if it is your firm, for it to be recognized as an auditing firm, then it must actually be approved by ISPAC to be able to provide auditing services. So for you as one of the members there, or one of the staffs or one of the managing directors there, then of course you've actually been approved by ISPAC to provide auditing services. So that is the root of actually being able to get this particular certification and actually membership from, from ISPAC. You've done CPA exam up to final, level. So once you finish, you become a member, you practice for a certain time, a period of time, you'll basically be approved to provide auditing services. So this is the, these are the key qualifications. So apart from you being a member of ISPAC, under the Accountants Act, they could actually basically look at any other relevant qualification that can actually basically make you to be able to provide auditing uh, services. Maybe you've done any foreign qualifications that can be recognized in Kenya, like ACCA, so in such a case, it basically means that they could look at any other relevant qualification that could actually basically maybe rank same as actually having a CPA in, in Kenya. Then, of course, they can actually basically approve you uh, to be able to be an auditor or be approved to provide auditing uh, services, to provide auditing uh, services. So these are the key qualifications of how, uh, or the key qualifications that are actually required of an auditor of a company, are required of an auditor of of a company. So um, the appointment, this is how the basically the appointment, appointment will actually happen. So these are basically the appointment will actually happen. So the key parties that will actually be able to appoint an auditor in the company. So you have just two key parties. Uh, for example, on formation of the company, on formation of the company, the auditor can be appointed by the board of directors, but subsequently Subsequently, I hope you remember what you said under, under the topic of company meetings, that at the AGM, at the AGM, the members will actually be able to appoint an auditor of, of the company. So of course, on formation of the company, when the company is being formed, there hasn't been any AGM in the company. So therefore, of course, the appointing authority in this case could actually be the board of directors, or maybe it could be the promoter of the company. Appointing, appointing the first auditors of, of the company. But subsequently, of course, at each and every annual general meeting, the members will decide who will actually be uh, the auditor for the next financial year. So that is what will actually happen subsequently at any other AGM of, of the company. But initially on formation of the, uh, the company, then of course, basically it means that the board of directors or maybe the promoter of the company, once they have maybe the first board of directors meeting, they will actually, of course, approve or basically appoint a person who likely serve as the auditor of the company until the first AGM. So such that subsequently, at each and every annual general meeting, the members will likely appoint the auditor of, of the company, will likely appoint the auditor of the company. So in this case, of course, there are just two key um, parties that can actually be able to appoint an auditor in a company. You can talk of maybe the board of directors on formation of the company, or maybe you could actually talk of uh, the members. These are the key parties. So these are the key parties that actually appoint an audit time in a company. Because we are, we are basically saying this audit is coming in to protect their interest. So that's why at each and every AGM, they will determine whether the previous auditor will continue to serve as an auditor, or maybe they could actually decide to appoint another person to serve as the auditor of, of the company, to serve as the auditor of, of the company, to serve as the auditor of, of the company. So for example, if it is maybe um, Parastato, so sometimes we could actually talk about maybe like a parastato or any uh, uh, any company or corporate body that they, uh, maybe the government has a, uh, an interest in. For example, if that particular parastato, maybe that particular corporate body has failed to appoint an auditor, then of course we could have maybe the relevant, 
so sometimes you can actually have the relevant cabinet secretary relevant cabinet relevant cabinet secretary appointing appointing an auditor in such in such a case for example it is a parastato under maybe the ministry of education so they haven't been able to appoint an auditor so you can actually step in the cabinet secretary can actually step in and actually appoint an auditor for such a corporate body for such a corporate body but generally those persons who are actually supposed to appoint an auditor in a company are actually the members of of the company so on commission it could actually be, be maybe the board of directors so each and every agm the members will decide who will be uh, the auditor of the company who will actually be the auditor of the company so it'll serve for the whole financial year until uh, the next financial year or maybe until the next the next agm so what will normally actually happen the previous auditor for example if his term has not actually come to an end he'll automatically be reappointed. So he'll actually automatically be reappointed. So unless other circumstances have actually fallen in place, for example, he basically he is not qualified to be reappointed. So you could actually be asking how could he not, not actually be qualified to be reappointed, yet he, will, he has been serving as an auditor of the company. Maybe his certificate of practice has been revoked by the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. So maybe he hasn't actually followed the professional requirements, for example, integrity, honesty, independence. So ISPAC discovers that this particular auditor is basically carrying out his work without the required professional standards. So in such a case, they could actually revoke his certificate of practice. So this means that, uh, for example, if he was serving as an auditor of the company at the next AGM, of course, he's not qualified because his certificate of practice has been revoked. So you are seeing generally the previous auditor will automatically be reappointed at the next AGM in case this term has not come to an end unless certain circumstances have actually fallen in place. For example, if he is not qualified to be reappointed, and I've said he can actually not be qualified to be reappointed, for example, if his certificate of practice has been revoked by the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of, of Kenya. Another one, it could be maybe he voluntarily resigns. He doesn't want to be the auditor of the company. In such a case, these particular members at the AGM will actually basically appoint another person. So he won't actually be reappointed. He won't actually be reappointed. Or maybe if the members feel that uh, they're not comfortable with his actually work, so they decide that they'll pass a resolution not for him to actually to be reappointed, to, re to, be, reappoint, to be, be reappointed as the auditor of the company, as the auditor of the company. So they decide to appoint another Another person. So those circumstances can actually make the auditor not to be reappointed. Reappointed. For example, if he voluntarily resigns, so he won't actually be reappointed. 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 For example, if he is not actually qualified to continue to serve as the auditor of the company, <coughs> or to be reappointed. Or for example, we could actually talk about if the members just pass a resolution they want to appoint another person and they don't want him to be the auditor of the company, to be the auditor of the company. In such a case, it basically means that they likely appoint another person to serve as an auditor of the company, to serve as an auditor of the company, to serve as an auditor of the company. <clears throat> so maybe you can look at um, a few past paper questions here, a few past paper questions here. So we can look at a few past paper questions here. So we can look at a few past paper questions here. So you can look at this one. We can look at November 2016, question 6A. We can look at November 2016, question 6A. November 2016, question 6A. November 2016, question 6A. November 2016, question 6A. So I don't know if you are there. November 2016, question 6A. 
November 2016, question 6A. November 2016, question 6A. So have you gotten the question, November 2016, question 6A? November 2016, question 6A. So I can see Catherine saying yes. I don't know if the others have gotten the question. November 20, November 2016, question 6A. So it says, it says, it says the Companies Act provides that if no auditor has been appointed by the end of the next period for appointing or the auditor, any auditor in office immediately before that time is taken to be reappointed at that time. With the reference to the public company, summarize five exceptions to the above provision. Summarize five exceptions to the above provision. So you are saying automatically, the previous auditor will be presumed to be reappointed, uh, will actually be presumed to be reappointed, but certain circumstances can actually make him not to actually to continue to serve us as an auditor serve as an auditor. So number one, with the reference to the public companies, summarize five exceptions to the above provision. So that is what basically I've just been uh, talking talking about. So he won't actually automatically be reappointed, but reappointed if, number one, he is not qualified for reappointment. He is not qualified for reappointment. So that is number one. Number two, a resolution has been passed to reappoint someone else. A resolution has been passed to reappoint someone else. So a resolution has been uh, passed to actually appoint someone else to serve as an auditor and not him to be reappointed. Then uh, number three, a resolution has been passed that he should be, he should not actually be reappointed. A resolution has been passed, he should not be reappointed. Re so number two, you are saying, he, uh, number one, you are saying, of course, number one, you are saying he is not qualified for reappointment. He is not qualified for reappointment. Or number two, you can talk about a resolution has been passed to reappoint someone else. A resolution has been passed to reappoint someone else. To reappoint someone else. To reappoint someone else. Then number three, we can talk about a resolution has been passed that he should not be reappointed. So the members have decided he should not actually be reappointed. Then number four, you can talk about he has given the company a notice he has given the company a notice that he is not willing. He has given the company a notice that he is not willing. That he is not willing to be reappointed. That he is not willing to be reappointed. He has given the company a notice that he is not willing to be reappointed. Then the last one we can talk about if his term of service has come to an end. If his term of service has come to an end. If his term of service has come to an end. So I think there are certain requirements that uh, you shouldn't actually be continuously be an auditor for the same client for a particular number of, of years. So if his term of service has come to an end, then of course he won't actually be reappointed. So just to protect independence, it's good that uh, you don't actually always audit uh, the same plan for maybe like a period of over 10 years. 
at least you change the auditors so that so that you can actually uh, basically ensure this independence or maybe it could be that you are the auditor of the company then of course uh, during that particular financial year one of your relatives or maybe one of your brother or someone has actually been appointed as a senior officer in the, in the company like a director so of course in such a case you lose independence so you can say uh, if this term uh, the last one if this term of service has come to an end if this term of service has come to an end has come to an end so of course, automatically the previous auditor will actually be reappointed, but certain circumstances can actually make him not to be reappointed, can actually make him not to be reappointed. Then, uh, mm, of course, we've said the first auditors of the company will likely be appointed by the board of directors. So these particular auditors will likely serve until the next AGM. So subsequently, at each and every AGM, the members will likely be able to serve as uh, the auditor, uh, to, to basically appoint the auditor of the company. But sometimes there could actually be a cash of vacancy also in the office of the auditor. So of course, the directors can actually still appoint an auditor in the case of that particular cash of vacancy. But that auditor will actually serve until the next AGM when the members would actually decide who will be actually be the auditor of, of the company, will actually be the auditor of, of the company. So when you talk about the remuneration, basically the remuneration of the auditor will actually be set, will actually be set uh, by these particular parties appointing him as the auditor of, of the company. If it is actually the members appointing him, then of course they are the ones who will actually basically set what will be his, his remuneration. If it is the board of directors actually appointing him as the auditor of the company, then of course they likely basically set what will be actually be his remuneration. If it is basically maybe the relevant cabinet secretary appointing an auditor of the company, then of course he likely set the remuneration basing on how much the company can actually be able to, uh, to pay him as an auditor of the company. So these particular parties are the ones who likely basically be able to uh, set what will be his remuneration in, in the company. So this remuneration could actually come in different forms. So they could decide they are going to pay him like uh, a salary, or maybe they could actually decide they're actually going to pay him a certain amount. So the remuneration of the, this particular auditor will actually come in different ways. For example, they could decide they pay what is known as audit fees. So they can pay audit fees. So it could come in terms of the audit fees. It could come in terms of maybe reimbursement of expenses incurred by the auditor while carrying out the audit work. So they could reimburse him certain expenses. For example, it could be uh, this particular client is actually maybe far away. So what this particular client normally does is basically sends transport or maybe a fare for this particular auditor to maybe reach his premises. Or maybe he fuels the vehicle for the auditor to reach his premises. So that one will likely still be seen as a remuneration for this particular auditor. Or maybe we can actually maybe say they basically provide lunch for the staff of the auditor when they're actually visiting the premises of, of the client or maybe the premises of the company being audited. So that one will likely be still actually seen as the remuneration for, for the auditor. So the remuneration can actually come in different ways as audit fees, reimbursement of expenses, or extension of any facility to the auditor to enable him carry out his work as the auditor of the company, for example, providing lunch, maybe at the premises of the company while he's carrying out the, the audits. So that will likely still be presumed as the remuneration for, for this. But of course, the key remuneration is actually payment of the audit fees, maybe at the end of uh, his work as an auditor of the company, as an auditor of, of the company, as an auditor of the company. So we can actually look at uh, uh, this particular question. So it's November 2017, question 1C. November 2017, question 1C. November 2017, question 1C. Roman 1, <clears throat> Roman 1. November 2017, question 1C, Roman 1. November 2017, question 1C, Roman 1. It says, summarize four rules governing the appointment of the first auditors of a company. Then Roman 2, outline two ways in which a company auditor might receive his remuneration, might receive his remuneration. 
So you can start with the second one, outline two ways in which the company auditor might receive his remuneration. So of course you are saying the auditor's remuneration will likely be set by the appointing authorities. In this case, if it is the board of directors that are actually appointing the auditor, they will set his remuneration. If it is the members at the AGM, they will basically set what will be his remuneration as the auditor of the company. So the remuneration we are saying can actually come in these ways. So they outline two ways in which company auditor might receive his remuneration. So can actually talk about audit fees, can actually be paid audit fees. Number two, you can actually be able to talk about reimbursement of expenses incurred while carrying out his work as an auditor of, of the company. So when I talk about the audit fees or reimbursement of expenses incurred while carrying out his work as an auditor of, of the company. So that could actually be a way through which this particular auditor can actually be remuneration. So the remuneration could actually come in those, in those ways. So audit fees or maybe reimbursement of expenses. And then I've actually also told you extension of any facility to enable him carry out his work as an auditor of, of the company. Extension of, of any facility to enable him carry out his work as an auditor of, of the company. So the remuneration could actually come out, uh, come out in those particular ways. So audit fees and what we've just uh, talked about. Then there's that uh, Roman one which says, summarize four rules governing the appointment of first auditors of, of the company. So summarize four rules governing the appointment of the first auditors of the company, the first auditors of the company. So if that one basically comes in, or basically they test such, then of course the first thing that should actually come to your mind, the first thing that should actually come to your mind the first thing that should actually come to your mind then of course is that the first auditor will actually be appointed by the directors of the company or the board of directors. So that is point number one that you can actually be able to put there. The first auditor will be appointed by the directors of the company or the board of directors. Then number two, he will hold office, he will hold office, he will hold office until the end of the first AGM. He will hold office until the end of the first AGM. So that's when the members will actually basically take over the appointment of the auditor. So number two, he will hold office until the end of the first AGM. He will hold office until the end of the first AGM. Then number three, what you can actually be able to talk about if there's a cash of vacancy in the office of the first auditor, if there is a cash or vacancy in the office of the first auditor, if there is a cash or vacancy in the office of the first auditor, the directors will appoint his replacement. The director will appoint his replacement or it will be filled by the directors. Just say it will be filled by the directors. If there's a cash or vacancy in the office of the first auditor, it will be filled by the directors. So remember, there's a cash or vacancy that has actually arisen before the first AGM. So the directors are the ones who will actually still appoint the auditor to serve until the end of the first AGM. If there's any cash or vacancy in the office of the first auditor, it will be filled by the directors. So it will be filled by the directors of, of the company. Then you can talk about um, if the directors fail to appoint one, to appoint an auditor, if the directors fail to appoint uh, the first auditor, if the directors fail to appoint the first auditor, the company can make an application to the relevant cabinet secretary to appoint an auditor of the company. If the directors fail to appoint the first auditor, the company can make an application to the relevant cabinet secretary, to the relevant cabinet secretary to appoint one, to appoint one, to appoint one, to appoint one. To appoint one, to appoint one. So if they ask for any details to do with the first auditor, that's what you can actually be able to talk about the first auditor of, of the company, that this particular first auditor will be appointed by the directors. So he'll serve as an auditor until the end of the first AGM. 
if there's a cache of vacancy in the office of the first auditor, it will still be filled by the directors. And that auditor coming in to serve in the cache of vacancy will serve until the end of the first AGM when members could decide they reappoint him or they actually appoint another person as an auditor of, of the company, as an auditor of the company. If the company fails to appoint the auditor, maybe the company could actually make an application of the relevant cabinet secretary to be able to appoint the auditor of, of the company, to be able to appoint the auditor of, of the company, the auditor of the company. So we can look at what are the duties of the auditor, what are the duties of the auditor, and maybe look at some of his rights as an auditor of the company, some of his rights as an auditor of the company. So the duties of an auditor, what are the duties of an auditor in a company? So among the key duties of an auditor in a company is basically to be able to ensure that he's a quant of himself of what are his roles or actually mandate under the articles of, of the company. For example, the articles of the company could actually basically clearly state the auditor in this particular company will be performing this particular function.